Hello. Well, today I'll be talking about two books written by the author Guy Lyon Playfair. The two books are The Unknown Power and The Indefinite Boundary. Well, I first bought The Unknown Power back in the mid-1970s and I paid 20 pence for a brand new copy of it from John Menzies in Pontypridd. I bought it because I thought Guy would be talking about the Qi of Aikido or the Qi as in Tai Chi Chuan being the unknown power. But I don't recall reading the book and then just before or sorry, just after lockdown, I fancied a book to read whilst lounging in our hot tub. And I, d I don't read any books that I wouldn't want to accidentally drop in the water. So I picked this one from the 1970s, because it was looking a bit uh, dog-eared by then, even if it hadn't been read. I think Guy was inspiring me to read the book, as it turned out to be one of the best books on all the subjects of the paranormal one could read. I quickly followed up by sending off for Guy's indefinite boundary. And in fact, the two books could almost be read as one, as together they teach everything you need to know about the paranormal, extrasensory perception, telepathy, all varieties of mediumship, psychic surgery, spiritual healing, Brazilian spiritism and much, much more. And the life stories of the people that Guy has talked about are quite incredible. So Guy Lyon Playfair was a British writer and parapsychologist who was born in Quetta, India on the 5th of April 1935. He studied modern languages at the University of Cambridge and then worked as a journalist for Life magazine and other publications. In the early 1960s he moved to Rio de Janeiro where he worked as a freelance journalist. Hence his involvement with Brazilian Spiritism and the Parapsychology Societies in Brazil. I think he was put on to psychic healing in Brazil when he had a mysterious and quite quite a nasty illness and he sought out uh, psychic surgeons to give himself healing. So he became interested in parapsychology in the early 1970s when back in Britain and he investigated a number of cases of paranormal activity, including the Enfield Poltergeist case. He published his first book on parapsychology, The Red Cow, as, or as we know it, The Unknown Power, in 1975, and then went on to write several other books on the subject, including The Indefinite Boundary in 1984 and Twin Telepathy their psychic connection in 2002. So Guy Playfair was a member of the Society for Psychical Research and the Parapsychological Association. He was also a psychic consultant for the BBC when they did their production Ghost Watch, which was aired on Halloween 31st of October 1992. Guy died in London on April the 8th, 2018, at the age of 83. He was a respected figure in the field of parapsychology and his work helped to raise awareness of the subject. And round about the time that I was reading the book uh, from the hot tub, uh, we were working with the Spiritualist National Union International, which was uh, a, an internet form of the union and I was talking with someone 
and I mentioned that I thought Guy Lyon Playfair was the one person who's, who's written the best account of all, all the paranormal phenomena. And this lady was um, a professor or a doctor of medicine or something based in a university in Scotland and she said he was one of my best friends. Fancy that. Uh, a small world that we move in, isn't it? So uh, Guy Lyon Playfair, some of his best works are The Unknown Power, Indefinite Boundary, Twin Telepathy. This house, house is haunted. The true story of the Enfield poltergeist, poltergeist phenomenon, that was 1989, and a directory of paranormal phenomena, 1994. His work has been praised by some of his critics for its rigour and honesty, while others criticised his willingness to believe in the paranormal. Yeah, yeah, but he experienced it. And once you've experienced things, you can't do otherwise than believe. And he rigorous, rigorously tested uh, the things that were going on around him. Well, you read the books and judge for yourself whether he, he was too willing to believe. And there's no doubt that he was a significant figure in the field of parapsychology in the 20th and the 21st centuries. And his work will be continued to, to be studied by researchers for years to come. So the Enfield Poltergeist investigation is an interesting one. And we'll call it alleged supernatural activity because it covered a variety of paranormal phenomena, uh, some of which is put down to the teenage hormones of the young females involved. It took place at 284 Green Street in Brimsdown Enfield and we'll take a look at uh, the house itself and we'll hear some of the testimony from Maurice Gross and eventually then uh, from uh, Guy Playfair himself. And that took place in 1977 and 79, centred around the sisters of Janet, aged 11, and Margaret Hodgson, aged 13. Now the Hodgson family first reported the disturbances in August 1977, and they claimed that objects were moving on their own, furniture was being thrown around, and they were being physically attacked. The family also reported hearing voices and seeing strange lights. So the case was investigated by Maurice Gross, ably assisted by Guy Lyon Playfair. Maurice Gross was an inventor and a member of the Society for Psychical Research. And both Guy Playfair and Maurice Gross believed that the subject matter was genuine. So let's take a few um, a little look at a few videos on the subject. Um, the one with Esther Ranson as the compare in her show with Maurice Gross as on the panel uh, giving his testimony. And you'll see that there's uh, other people involved and it's very difficult for Maurice Gross to get his point across amongst the uh, scepticism involved. what we want to hear. There is a long tradition of attempting to capture supernatural occurrences on tape. In 1972, Maurice Gross from Ponder's End claims to have recorded a poltergeist in this disturbing nationwide report. Knock one for no and two for yes. Did you used to live in this house? You did. God. Now why are you here? Are you unhappy? You're not unhappy. But why are you here? Is it because you want to give us a special message? No. Are you having a game with me? Oh, oh right. Oh, oh. As I asked the question, are you having a game with me? It threw the cardboard box and the pillow right at my face. What's up? 
and and for causes them to heat up when they move. So but there's someone like there. Chris French were to say, look, let me investigate this objectively, scientifically. Let me come and watch you with your well, plate you of porridge. Well, you have to spend a bit of time because it doesn't happen every day. <laughs> and I think you get a bit bored because in between, it's very, nothing happens. Can, can I tell you about one experiment we did with the, with the actual focus of the activity in... in uh, the girl Janet. In we actually, we actually, we did a, a test what at Black Black College, London University. Yeah. Professor Hash did ask me to come along to bring the girl with him to do a test to see whether she you know, actually could levitate there. I took the girl along, and we put her on a test bed, and then we said, to, I said to her, Janet, sit perfectly still, and I want you to try and levitate. Do you understand what I mean? She said, yes, I you want me to go up in the air? I said, fine. So she sat there perfectly still whilst we watched our instruments, and... Uh, for a little while, nothing happened. And suddenly, there was a burst, and the uh, dial, the main dial, went over like that, zoom. Held it for five seconds, then came back. You it, have a record of this? Oh, yes, yes, yes. A graph? Yes, yes. yes. Uh, three times in one minute. Now, the extraordinary thing is, when we analyze that, she didn't lose weight, as you would have expected if she levitated. She actually gained weight. She gained one kilogram of weight for five seconds, three times in one minute. Have you published now, these, these that, results? Oh, it has been published, yes. Where? Professor has to publish it. You're Where? at London University. Where? London University. Where? Where? College. Where is Where? Where? College. Have you published, it, was it in published a, in a scientific journal? Yes. yes, it has been published. What? I can't, I can't remember exactly what journal, but it has been published. No, the reason I'm published. asking you this is yes. that these extraordinary um, yes. events which contradict all known yes. laws of yes, physics sure. surely ought to be known to the wider but scientific Excuse me, they are, we've got my society, the, the Society for Psychological Research, which is the leading scientific society in the world for the study of this, what are you laughing at? <laughs> Absolutely incredible. The, the, incredible. the work of the SPR seems in the arc. They have no idea of well, the electromagnetic okay. aspects uh, of uh, this. Excuse me. Uh, not the mere fact that we've had no prize winners. You can't vote until things get stereo. Well, well we, we, uh, I'm not going to argue with such nonsense. I'm sorry. I'm no, not even going to There's a man price. in Canada I'm not even who going can to reproduce. Now, let me just say, Morris, yes. there's a man. You know what I'm going to say. This is what I don't want you to say. Morris, I'm going to say this. There's a man in Canada called John Hutchison. Yes, I know about John Hutchison as well. Yeah. In the laboratory, levitating yeah. objects, yes. water levitating, John, metal bending, I know. how, John, I know all about what, is, it. what John Hutchison has done, he's crammed a room like, with um, yes, different kinds of electrical equipment, Van de Graaff generators, Tesla coil signal yeah, generators, sure. yeah. and he's set them all going at the same yeah. time. And what and then happens? Well, objects levitate, metal bends... Mm. Well, they were very interesting videos, weren't they? So the events that were reported during this investigation were objects moving on their own, such as furniture, dishes and toys and boxes and pillows, as we saw in Morris's um, sketch. There was furniture being thrown around and the F Hodgson family were physically attacked, being pushed and scratched. And they recorded voices as well as hearing them strange lights were seen. Let's take a listen to an interview by Rita for Crypt Paranormal TV on YouTube. Uh, and it's a telephone interview with Guy and it's great to hear his voice if not to see him on screen. No doubt there are plenty of videos uh, with Guy featured in them because he embraced this form of recording of his uh, lifelong work. And if you scan through YouTube, you will find them. So let's listen to Guy and Rita. The Crypt Interviews, in association with Mayo Legend Point Castle Bar. The Enfield Poltergeist is the name given to the claims of poltergeist activity at a council house in Enfield, England from 1977 to 1979 involving two sisters, Janet Hodgson, age 11, and her sister Margaret, age 13. Members of the Society for Psychical Research, Morris yep. Gross and freelance writer Guy Lyon Playfair, 
believe this to be a genuine case of poltergeist activity and Guy is here today to tell us about his experience of the Enfield haunting. So firstly Guy, could you tell us what a poltergeist is? Um, no. <laughs> um, it's a word we use for something we don't understand. It, it's actually um, what they call a syndrome, you know, a concurrence of symptoms, meaning a lot of things that happen together. And we just call them poltergeist because um, in the 500 years since Martin Luther introduced the word, nobody's come up with a better one, which is a bit strange, but it's, um, it's almost exactly 500 years since the word first appeared in print although it was probably used before print, but um, Martin Luther was always banging on about poltergeists. And he also called them rumplegeists, which is rather a nice word. Perhaps we should use that in rumplegeist. Sounds good in English, but it's, um, it's yeah, 500 years. It was about 15 or 20 that he wrote one of his innumerable pamphlets about something or other. I'm sure not very popular in, in Ireland, but um, he, he did have... Um, a lot to say about poltergeists, and for him, of course, they were simply evil spirits, which is a bit uh, simple, simplified, and I don't, yeah. I don't agree. I think he's wrong. Um, they're not evil spirits at all. Well, then, how, how did you first come to be involved in the Enfield case, and what was the family experiencing at the time? Well, it was uh, a series of weird coincidences got me involved because I was um, uh, planning to go on holiday after spending two years writing a very long and difficult book, mm -hmm. which I was glad to get rid of. And um, I'd actually been waiting for a bus that, that afternoon, afternoon to take me to the um, Romanian embassy to get a visa. And as was quite common in those days, the bus didn't come. Mm -hmm. So I thought, to hell with that, I'll go tomorrow. And then in the evening, I went to um, the Society for Psychical Research Lecture, which happened to be on poltergeist. I sat in front of a fellow I'd only met once called Maurice Gross, who was a new member, and we just exchanged sort of greetings. And I, I didn't know him at all well. Anyway, at the end of the talk, uh, Maurice leapt to his feet and said he was studying a very interesting case in North London right now. Mm -hmm. and he'd appreciate some help. I did not offer to help. I, I wanted to go on holiday. Mm -hmm. So I, I couldn't very well escape because I was sitting right next to him, mm -hmm. in, 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 right in front of him, right in front. And I turned around and said, let me know if you get really stuck and I'll see what I can do, but I'm going away next week. Somehow I never made it to the Romanian embassy on the Friday, and on Sunday morning I heard Maurice on BBC News at lunchtime. He got it onto the news programme. Their reporter, Rosalind Morris, had stayed up all night at the house and recorded some pretty interesting noises and um, got into the studio, uh, still awake, and done a very competent and interesting piece on the case. So I thought, well, hang on, the holiday has to wait. This is, this is a good one. And I'm not just going to walk out on a, on a really interesting sounding case yeah. not too far away from where I live. I mean, it's, it's on the underground, so I get there in about 40 minutes. And I called up Maurice and said, well, I'll pop in this evening, just sort of see what I can do. And um, I stayed for, on and off for 14 months. So um, that's how it began. Well, what was it that convinced you this was a genuine case? Oh, straight off. I mean, f um, first of all, the atmosphere in the house, they were all scared out of their wits. I mean, they were absolutely terrified. And how do you fake that? And why would you fake that? And they wouldn't even go, go into the toilet on their own. The girls had to go both together, you know, and they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't go to the kitchen to, to make me a cup of tea on their own. They, they had to have somebody with them. Uh, they slept with the light on all night for several months. They really were scared, and, and, and after um, after they got into bed, when when things tended to be rather worse, you could tell that they were absolutely terrified. And uh, luckily, Maurice had a very very uh, very good way with with children. He had two of his own. He was very good at calming them down and telling them that it had happened before to other people. It was known as a poltergeist. It was a word they'd never heard. In fact, Janet immediately called it a polka dice, which, uh, which is how I will always remember it, the infield polka dice, and um, they gradually sort of got used to it, and um, Morris did a really superb job of, of social welfare, I mean, he, he stopped them being terrified and got them interested, 
And that's not easy. I mean, not many people can do that because there, there are very few people who have the faintest idea of what, what happens on a, on a poltergeist case, which luckily he did because he'd read quite a lot. Of, and I'd already been on several other cases in, when I lived in Brazil where they were pretty common. And so um, the family was pretty lucky. They, they had two um, uh, fairly w well educated in matters of poltergeist yeah. um, investigators to help them out, and uh, I think we did. And I believe a policewoman even signed a police report saying she'd witnessed a chair move yeah. by itself. On the first day, yes, that's right. They, they, um, there was such an atmosphere of panic on the first night that they, they called the police or rather the neighbours did, the other half of the semi-detached house, they, they, they heard all the commotion and came in to see what they could do. And they called the police and um, two of them turned up, including a, a young woman who I think had only just joined the force. She was very young, in her early 20s. She gave us a written, signed statement a couple of days later to say that she'd seen a chair sliding along the floor in front of her eyes with nobody anywhere near it. And um, I later saw exactly the same thing myself. I thought, well, there aren't many poltergeist cases where you get evidence from the police on the first yeah. day. It was a good start. Well, then, could you tell me about the voice that came from Janet? Oh, I could indeed. That was much later, and it's quite a long story. I, I was tempted to say, read the book, but I'm sure you will or you have. So, so um, we actually asked for it because, because what happened was we started to hear strange kind of whistling noises, quite loud, and since the girls have never been heard to whistle before, and Janice had quite a serious um, tooth problem in those days, she needed her teeth straightening, which she's... Mm -hmm. So she's had since and now speaks quite normally but when she was 11 she, she, she had a, a very um, a very sort of distorted palate and she couldn't whistle but she couldn't sort of uh, get her lips into the right shape you know so she couldn't do it and here were these whistles and then Morris Gross who was a very down to earth fellow he, he was a uh, electrical engineer and inventor, you know, he didn't have much time for ghosts and spirits and things, yeah. but he saw we had a problem here, so he, he set about trying to solve it, and he, he said, um, okay, if you can whistle and grunt, we were getting grunts as well, why don't, why don't you talk? So go on, say my name, gross. And quite after two or three attempts, we had this extraordinary gross, which um, really startled me. I mean, it was very loud. And it was absolutely uh, like an old man. It was not a 11-year-old girl's voice. And um, I happened to have a niece uh, at the same age, and I played her a tape recording, and I said, can you do that? And she could, but she said, ow, that, that really gave me, gave me a hurt to the throat. Yeah, I could imagine. Because it does. I mean, you try it. It's, it's very, very uh, yeah. hard on the larynx. So, and Janet could keep it up for hours. I mean, she, she could just go on and on and on. And sometimes very, very loud. I mean, really sort of shouting extraordinary noise. We had a speech therapist who um, we managed to persuade to come and listen, and she got totally freaked out and left very early and refused to talk about it afterwards. And she, all she would say was that she'd never heard anything like it. I rather gathered that she hoped she never would again. Uh, we also um, got hold of the professor of phonetics at Birkbeck College, London University, who very kindly lent us a thing called a laryngograph which is a couple of metal plates that you clamp onto the neck, and um, that records the signals of, of your vocal apparatus. And he established that the voice was not made by Janet's normal vocal cords. It was yeah. made by the false vocal cords, or if you wanted in the original, the plica ventricularis, which is what um, actors of commercials use for making those sort of noises. Yeah. And they can't keep it up for very long. They, they get a sore throat as well. They, they don't do it more than they have to because it's, it's very painful. In fact, we have Maurice Scrooge offered a, a reward of £500 to anybody, any of these sort of rents of skeptic people who turn up and, and know the answers to everything. He said, OK, bring along your 11-year-old and keep that up for, for, I think, half an hour, normal conversation, and I'll give you 500 quid. And nobody took it up. One famous skeptic, uh, Susan Blackmore, who had a daughter conveniently at the same age, 
She said casually, oh yes, my daughter can do that. So we said, okay, bring her on and we'll give you 500 quid. And she, we never heard from her again. Speaking of the sceptics there, something they all kept talking about in any documentary you watch about this is that the girls had apparently admitted 2% fakery in various instances. So why do you think they felt the need to play pranks when all this activity was going on? Well, if you know 11-year-old girls who don't play pranks, then you're yeah. lucky because they do. And um, they'd be rather sort of unnatural if they didn't. And they, um, it's also, I think, you don't have to be a professional child psychologist to know that children learn practically everything they know by imitation. So if they've got a poltergeist around paging around the house, they're going to start imitating it. That is absolutely natural. And I thought it was a sign, that very encouraging sign, that life was getting back to normal. Because they certainly didn't do anything like that to start with. And um, also, I must say, they were totally, they were no good at it. They were absolute failures as things, <laughs> um, as they've freely admitted ever since. Um, the first thing they did was they, when I went out to the pub for, for my um, evening meal, because I never let them uh, feed me in, in the house, they decided to hide my tape recorder in somewhere. And um, when I got back, they said the ghost had taken it away. So I thought, oh, yes, and I found it in about two minutes. And it was still recording. Oh, dear. So they mm. recorded all the evidence of what themselves. they told Yeah. And I, all I did was just play it back, and I didn't say anything. Well, I think I just said, uh, nice try. <laughs> yeah. And we forgot yeah. about it, and they didn't do it again. So, I mean, what? It's no big deal at all. It didn't bother me. It didn't bother them. And um, I did ask them not to play around with my tape recorder because they were very expensive in the 1970s. They, they cost a lot more than they do today, relatively. I, I, I didn't... It did... The, the recorder later on did fly across the room on its own, which didn't do any good, but that was not the girls. That was, that was something else. But that was the first time they decided to play a trick, and um, they did very few more. They, 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 um, we found a chair balanced on the border door very precariously, quite cleverly, and then um, once we got that down and sorted, it happened again. This time, not, not quite so um, exactly. And I thought that was a bit suspicious, and, and um, Janice admitted that they had done that one. So I took the attitude of... Sort of look, we got enough real stuff happening. There's no need to add to it, and they they, they stopped it. I mean, they, they when when the book appeared and we had all sorts of radio plugs and things, uh, they were asked over and over again if you played any tricks. And uh, Janet always answered almost in the same words, "Oh yes, once or twice, just to see if Mr. Gross and Mr. Playfair would catch us." And they always did. Right. Unfortunately for these skeptics, we got it on tape. And I've got practically everything on tape, and all of these remarks are still available in the, um, hopefully, in the BBC and Channel 4 ITN archive, where she got onto the news uh, three times, including the World Service and also the French radio, saying the same thing. So it's on the record. I mean, it was, it was, <laughs> there's no doubt what she said. He said, we did play tricks once or twice just to see if they would catch us, and they always did. Well... The Conjuring Part 2 has been released this summer and it's based on the case files of Ed and Lorraine Warren and the Enfield haunting. But what oh, involvement exactly did the Warrens have in the case? Oh dear, the Warrens, yes. Well, um, not much is all I can say. I only met, um, I met them once, very briefly. All I can remember is Ed Warren telling me that he could make a lot of money for me. And I thought, well, I won't repeat what I thought. And that, that was but it looked to me like a fake researcher. And I just wanted to get away from him as soon as I could, which I, which I did. And I never saw him again. Um, I'm not aware that he did anything of any value at all. So basically, you know? were the Warrens there for like a day, a week? Did they have much time in the house at all? No. Uh, I, think, I think at the most, two or three days, possibly. And that was it. But I, I really don't know, because I wasn't there. I mean, I, I, um, th this um, they were there quite late in... in uh, 1978, when the case had pretty well died down, there wasn't very much happening, just occasional outbursts of movements and things, but nothing particularly un unusual. All, all, all the really heavy stuff had taken place in the first three months, between um, September and, well, four months, September, December, 77. That, that was the 
the most active period and after then it sort of slowly faded off. I think by the time the Warrens turned out there was really very little happening at all. So basically when this movie comes out it's going to be a very fictionalised version of the Enfield haunting. Yeah, I would imagine so, yes. And um, I, I've had absolutely nothing to do with it. They, they never consulted me. They didn't, mm -hmm. didn't have to. I mean, they're, they're dealing with uh, information in the public domain, and if they use any of my book, they're going to be in trouble. Uh, and they know that <laughs> because Morris Gross's son is a pretty hot shot lawyer from a large company in London, and he's um, not going to let them get away with any any sort of uh, plagiarism. So um, they can do what they like, and. and if it sells a few more books, fine. I mean, the, the um, channel, what was it, that um, Sky television Yeah, serial. that's going as there was a three-part Sky TV show called The Enfield Haunting. That was based on your book, was it? Uh, that was, yes, uh, and that was um, with my uh, cooperation to start with. Although if I'd known how it was going to turn out, I would have run away screaming because it had nothing to do with the, the book at all. Um, I mean, it, apart from the opening, and Maurice Gross's Jaguar, which was absolutely authentic, that, that was good, but everything else was, was pure fiction. So the, the, whole, the whole thing that was in that, that it was Maurice keeping the poltergeist there because his, had his daughter died, was that true or was that made uh, up? Well, that was true, yes, and um, there were various, sort of, again, strange coincidences, the fact that his daughter was called Janet. Mm-hmm. And Janet was called Janice, and they were about Janice Hodgson was a bit older. But um, Morris was pretty down to earth. So he never got carried away by by sort of supernatural fantasies. He was a very practical fellow. I mean, he, he was a, as I say, he was a mechanical engineer. I mean, where you have to get things right. He was also quite quite a philosophical fellow. He was interested in the mysteries of life, and um, he, he was quite. Um, Quite, quite religious. He, he was a warden of his local synagogue and uh, took took his religion very seriously, but not not sort of uh, aggressively so. Mm -hmm. he, he was a thoroughly uh, honourable, worthy man altogether. Well, one of the one of the finest people I've known, and um, completely um, dedicated to helping the, the two girls and. And all that nonsense about his wife having an affair with the mediums, and that's a total rubbish. And it just didn't happen, period. Was Janet's personality portrayed well, do you think? Well, <laughs> with all respect to dear Janet, I mean, she's not quite such a beauty as Eleanor, what's her name, who is obviously a, um, a very fine actress to come, mm -hmm. and she's already won several prizes. Um, including an Olivier Award for Best uh, Theatre in, um, I've forgotten the name of. But um, no, she didn't really um, look very much like Janet. The, the, the elder sister, Margaret, did. Mm -hmm. She was very well cast. She was um, very, very similar. And Timothy Spall was quite uncannily like Morris when he came to see me. I, I almost thought it was him, you know. Yeah. He, he, he'd studied a lot of um, videos, uh, clips that, that Morris had made, and he's a terrific actor and could do absolutely anything. You know, he'd just done uh, Turner, the painter. It couldn't be more different from a, a ghost investigator. But he, he was he was absolutely superb, and he, he um, we had a nice chat. And I, I told him um, sort of investigators of poltergeists are pretty normal people, I hope. And um, my, my, my approach to the thing was very much as I always had a, as a freelance, originally journalist. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd worked on the local paper in, in Rio de Janeiro, which is the traditional way to start, as you, as you know, covering plane crashes and political scandals and all that sort of thing, which Brazil has got plenty of both. So... Um, my attitude was go and see what's happening and write it down. I mean, that's as simple as that, and that's what I did at Enfield. Well, there was one part of the, of the TV programme I wanted to ask you if it was true. There was a scene where, um, I don't know, it was two other investigate, paranormal investigators were there, and they weren't believing the voice coming from Janet, and Morris put water in her mouth and then taped over her mouth, and the voice still came out. Did that happen? Yes, that, that, that did happen, um, and not only that, but it was um, 
it wasn't actually water. It was, um, well, it was water that had been stained with some kind of um, dye. So it was blue. And um, the idea was that when she spat it out at the end, you could tell that she hadn't swallowed it, which she hadn't. So, yes, that was true. But one or two of the minor incidents were true, I should say, but all, all the major stuff was, was complete fiction. Uh, when, when I pointed this out to the producer, I got the classic uh, reply that, oh, well, if we'd shown the real stuff, nobody would believe it. And I thought, well, what's, what's the point in making a film at all? And then uh, advertising it as based on a real case. And then not, not showing what the real case was. I mean, that's the sort of television mentality. It has to look good, whether it's true or not, is, is a trivial detail. One or two documentaries have done, done it very well on um, television, but uh, others, uh, all, all of the Sky uh, serial was very well made and excellent direction and production, all that, that but it was just simply not, not the same as, same as my book. Well, it really is a fascinating story, and I can imagine it was very traumatic for Janet. How is she today? What, what scars has this left on her? It has affected her. Um, of course, it's difficult to tell because um, I haven't seen a lot of her. I haven't seen her for um, a couple of years now, but we, we met in a TV studio, had quite a nice talk. She was very different from what she was as a teenager, I mean, she, she was very lively and bouncy as, as, um, as a 12-year-old, but she's now very quiet and, and rather withdrawn. Frequently, she's asked me if it's likely to come back, and I've, I've used every trick I know to persuade her that it won't, because if they don't, they don't come back. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I've told her more than once that if it did come back, it would be a world first, and you'd be famous again. So... She doesn't want to be famous again, so it hasn't come back. Uh, and um, yes, it did. It did have a, a big, big impact on her, and, and more than I realised at the time, because she, she was always very, um, extremely extrovert as, as, a, as a child. She was good, at, very good at sports and jumping around, and she was quite big for her age as well, and very athletic, and uh, also rather hyperactive, always rushing around and. And chattering away and so on, but not, uh, today she's absolutely different. We're very reserved and very devoted to her, her son. She's got two boys and um, a very supportive husband who keeps keeps everybody away from her. She absolutely does not want to be a celebrity, which she certainly mm. could be. She turned down a huge offer, which I actually arranged an um, interview with a well-known tabloid, and she just didn't didn't answer. I, I can produce testimony from the writer. I'm not actually sure if it was the Sun or the Daily Mail because he worked with both. Um, I think it was the Sun. They offered her 800 pounds for an interview, and she turned it down. And uh, they're not well off the family. They're, they're comfortable, but they're not rich. And she is not in it for the money, and never has been. And we've never paid her anything. We we did we did um, during the case we did ext manage to extort some fees from the TV people who turned up while it was going on because um, back in the 70s and 80s they had a lot more money to throw around. And Morris took the attitude what that um, Janet was supplying material to them, so they damn well pay for it. And 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 uh, he was very good at getting out of them. But we never we never made anything for ourselves at all. Nothing. And how about yourself at the moment? Have you any projects you're working on at the moment that you'd like to share with listeners? Well, yes. And, um, and I haven't been near a poltergeist for <laughs> 30 years, and I hope I never do. <laughs> I mean, one's enough, you know. I'd done quite a lot of them in, when I lived in Brazil, only about five or six there, and they are very exhausting. You, you never know what's going to happen next. You just can't relax at all, and it does wear you down. No, for about the last 20 years, I've been studying twins, which is very much more peaceful. They can be quite lively, but the, the way that they communicate with each other, which is very interesting, and nobody's ever done it, which, which I find quite astonishing. I'd say it's quite uh, fascinating. Well, I mean, you, you keep reading in the paper uh, stories about twins picking up uh, messages that the other ones had an accident or something. Yeah. It's always, it's always reported as if it was the first time it had ever happened. Well, the earliest report, report that I've got is from 1790. It's, it's the same old story. You know, we've had poltergeist reports since 1520, 
And we've had twin um, telepathy reports, at least since 1790, which was John Wesley, no less, the founder of the Methodist Church. So you'd think that uh, scientists would wake up and think there's something going on here, but they don't. They say, oh, well, it's just coincidence. And poltergeists are always naughty little girls playing tricks, although they don't know mm -hmm. how they do them. There are reasons for this. I mean, it's, it's all based on fear. You know, fear people are afraid of confronting reality. They really are. Um, I mean, I've, se I've seen this happen where people turn up and, um, well, the Enfield case was active. We had one or two psychologists who'd heard all about it, and they sort of came in and rather expected us to lay on a display of table tilting on demand. And um, when a few kind of minor noises and creaks and things happened, they, they, were, they were scared out of their wits. I mean, they just <laughs> got out as soon as they could. Uh, it's all very acceptable as fiction, you see. People love all these horror films and so on, but when, when somebody like me comes along and says, well, actually, this... this this does happen. Uh, then a, a whole different attitude comes into to work. I mean, the, the assumption is that I must be crazy. Well, maybe I am, but nobody ever accused me of being crazy when I worked for The Economist or Time magazine or Associated Press or McGraw Hill Business News and so on. I could go on for some time. Well, do you have a website or anything like that where people can follow your work? No, I, I, I'm, I'm a bit of a sort of low-profile individual. I don't like advertising myself. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm very happy to talk to you because you, obviously done, it's nice to talk to somebody who's really done the research properly and mm -hmm. um, gives me a chance to um, present the case without distortions. That's very much appreciated. But no, I, I don't need to advertise, I'm glad to say, because I've done quite well for myself one way or the other. And I've done 12 books and um, hundreds of articles and interviews and things. And I've also done consultant work for, for um, a lot of um, TV programs, which is usually complete rubbish, but they pay very well, and there's no harm in that. But I, I don't let it get in the way of my serious work, which I keep serious. The twin research is going quite well. We've finally, for the first time ever, managed to get cooperation of a major university department. Uh, London University has got the largest register in the world, 11,000 twins on the books. And um, my colleague Adrian Parker, from Professor of Psychology at Gothenburg University, he, he's got access as a visiting scientist. So they're being, they're being very helpful, and, and this has never happened before, because um, the subject of twin telepathy has always been kind of taboo. Yeah, and it's a very interesting topic. It's, it is, and I, I mean, it's, um, it, it's something that, um, as I say, it's, it's never been done before um, properly. It's been mentioned, certainly, but nobody has actually tested for it, which, which um, preliminary testing, which didn't really lead anywhere, but we have at last tried to identify the reasons why some twins are telepathic and some aren't, because a great many of them are not. And um, this doesn't seem to make sense. If they're identical, they should all be the same. Well, some identical twins are a lot more identical than others, as um, George Orwell might have put it. And that, that is absolutely true. And as um, far as I know, we are the first to try and work out why, how this could be. And I think it looks as though it's got something to do with exactly when they divide. You see, when a twin egg is fertilized, it, it splits... If it's going to split, it'll split within 12 days, or else you've got Siamese twins conjoined. Yeah. And uh, if the egg splits very early on, you get individually wrapped in your own little plastic bag, um, a neotic sack, and if it splits much later, you don't. You'd be in the same sack then? Well, it's not even sack. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's the unfortunate mother... <laughs> has to put up with these two things flushing around her belly and, and literally entangled with each other. And when they're born, they have to be pulled apart, literally. So, so talk about entanglement. I mean, that's it. And, and it, it's, um, it's, it's a very delicate business. That's why so many twins used to die, uh, die, be born dead until relatively recently. It, it's a terrible ordeal having twins for the unfortunate mother. I mean, mm -hmm. it's um, until about the middle of the 19th century... 
was quite unusual for both the twins to survive. And it was not unknown for both of them to die, and also the poor mother. So we've come a long way. I mean, the, we the, really have. You, you very rarely get get deaths, twin deaths at birth now, and and the mothers seem to be doing very well. I've met lots of them, and they're, they're all doing fine. And they they um they have now the, the this ultrasonic scan uh, where you can tell exactly when the when the zygote divides, so you know exactly um, what day it took place and if it's a very late uh, splitting uh, I, I, I can predict that they will develop a, a telepathic bond and if it's an early split they won't it's amazing how they can tell when the split was oh it's astonishing I know mm. I mean, I, I've, I've watched an um, ultrasonic scan on, on myself and it's really quite uh, <laughs> it's quite unsettling I mean you think all that sort of mess on the screen that's me <laughs> but um, I, I have I have seen film of, of twin um, zygotes actually splitting. It's fascinating. I mean, they, they, it's very recent as well. I mean, it's it's only been possible for for anybody to to go and watch uh, um, for a pregnant mother to keep an eye on her, mm -hmm. her twins. I'm not sure exactly when it became available on the National Health Service, but it's, it's um, certainly. Um, second half of the 20th century, I would say. I mean, you uh, can imagine if we'd had it earlier. I mean, it, it would have helped enormously. Yeah. It is certainly a fascinating subject, and I really wish the best of luck with all your research with it. And I want to thank you so much again, Guy, for coming on the show today, because I really want to hear your experience of the Enfield haunting. Well, it was a pleasure. Thank you. The Crypt Interviews, in association with Mayo Leisure Point Castle Bar. Now, as I mentioned, the books that Guy has written, and these two taken together, really do uh, give tremendous amount of proof of paranormal phenomena. And one of the incidents involves an early investigation of Guy's, which he says was poltergeist activity which included moving uh, a very heavy ob object. Let's uh, take up the story from the book called The Okamoto Farm. 34-year-old Kazunari Akaka Akaki went down to the Okamoto Farm on July the 1st and spent five days there. So Akaki is an investigator. As soon as he arrived after the long journey of over 600 miles, he was shown into the upper room over the storeroom, connected by a narrow stairway that could only be used by one person at a time. The room contained a bicycle, two gas containers, a hand cart and a number of smaller objects. That, according to Okamoto, had been transported there from down below. I'm presuming transported paranormally. Akaki helped carry them down again and then went off to town to see to his, to his tourist visa. When he came back, everything had been, everything he had moved was back in the upstairs room again. Clearly, he decided, Okamoto was playing tricks. Stones began to fall during dinner, but Akaki was still unimpressed. As he was getting ready to go to bed, some wrapped chocolates fell onto the floor of his bedroom. They could, he decided, have been thrown over the partition. The following day, as Mrs. Okamoto was making up his bed, he heard a loud crash coming from the bedroom and found a large truck wrench spanner under the bed. Akaki surely, one of the great sceptics of all time, was still unconvinced that anything paranormal was happening. There had to be a simple explanation. Somebody was playing tricks. The next afternoon he was forced to think otherwise. Returning from a drive in Okamoto's two and a half ton Toyota Jeep, he left it parked outside the front door and went into the house. Immediately he got inside the house, 
he heard a loud noise and hurrying outside again he saw the jeep some 40 yards away with its front part resting against a wooden fence there were no tire marks in the soft mud in between where he had left it and where it now most undoubtedly was moreover the jeep was in a position slightly uphill from where it had been parked a khaki had left it in gear and if it had somehow worked itself loose it would have rolled in the opposite direction Akaki began to suspect that something genuinely unusual might indeed be going on. He decided to make a test. Okamoto had told him that when the engine of the jeep was running, objects seemed more prone to being thrown about. So he, he asked the farmer to bring the jeep undamaged, except for a bent from the, from the mudguard in the front back to the front door and leave the engine running. He also remembered that in the past, twilight had been a time for peak poltergeist activity. Sure enough, as soon as Akaki went back into the house, some torch batteries were flung against the wall, while upstairs in his bedroom where he had been only a few minutes previously, there was a large piece of iron rail lying on his bed. I began to believe in the phenomena, he noted tersely. The piece of rail weighed 24 and a half kilos and was three feet long. Nobody could have carried it upstairs in the short time since he had been in the room before. The Paraguayan poltergeist was real. <laughs> and, and there's photographs of the jeep in its uh, resting position by the fence. How amazing is that? I think the, the, photo, the photographs are in the other book actually. Let me take a quick look. So that was the testimony of a Japanese investigator, Mr. Akaki. Now I mentioned that the books gave detailed histories of a number of people, especially in Brazil, who were famous mediums or psychic surgeons or healers or other workers in the paranormal field and one of the most famous is a man whose nickname was Chico and we call him Chico Xavier. A Brazilian medium uh, channeled spirits of the deceased to bring messages of comfort and hope to the living. He was also a prolific writer and he authored over 400 books including many that were dictated to him in a trance state by spirit people. And point of fact, I think they, every single book was dictated. Um, and I'm not sure if that was automatic writing or not, I have to reread the book. But um, Guy Lion Playfair met Chico Shavia. He, and he was at a, a great big sports state, uh, hall where Chico was giving healing and every time he did healing he would write a personal note and there would be a very long queue of people because every single person in that hall had a note handwritten by Chico Xavier on the day so it took a long time to, to, for, to complete his work and Guy uh, waited in line and got himself his own message The remarkable thing about Chico Xavier and all the books that he published would have made himself a millionaire many times over from the royalties of the books, but he never took a penny for it for himself. He put all the money from the books into a spiritism hospital that he founded. So all the money went for this hospital and, and charitable works, every penny of it. And you would think if he wrote 400 books that he would be a very intelligent, very well educated man. He had a small job in the government that, that was no more than um, fairly low grade. But he was uneducated. He had no formal education whatsoever. And, uh, you know, maybe Guy points out that he, he couldn't read or write. Uh, and yet he did. Um, maybe he didn't 
read and write in school. But it, very poor education and yet massive prolific author of books. And you'll find that the books are incredible where I think there was one Roman man dictating a bunch of books. So that was in, in, interesting to read. He did a lot of hospital work and Shavier's medium ship was often used to provide support to people who were ill in hospital. He would visit the hospitals and sit with patients and he would often channel his messages then from their loved ones. These messages would often provide comfort and hope to the patients and that in itself would sometimes lead to miraculous recoveries. Shavier's work as a medium was controversial and he was often accused of fraud but you know none of these great mediums got away without being accused of fraud and yet his body of work speaks for itself. Uh, it can be controversial. Yeah, I've read one of his books that uh, he spent a lot of time t talking about being in a shadow land which effectively was the um, halfway house uh, stated in the Bible. So if you want to read all about Chico Shavia, then these books are the place to find the, the details. Also in the books, you've got a great deal of um, work describing psychic surgery. So psychic surgery is an alternative form of medicine in which a psychic surgeon claims to be able to remove physical ailments from a patient's body, generally using only their hands or a blunt knife or a rusted razor blade. Uh, the most, it's most common in Brazil as a practice, but it has also been reported in other countries, especially the Philippines and the United States. Some of the famous psychic surgeons you read about in the books are a man called Arrigo, born in 1918, died in 1971. He was a Brazilian psychic surgeon who claimed to be able to remove tumours, cysts and other growths from patients' bodies. He was investigated by a number of researchers and no evidence of fraud was ever found. And then you've got J. Arrigo, born in 1921, died in 1971 again. He was also a Brazilian psychic surgeon a contemporary of Arrigo. He was also investigated by a number of researchers and again no evidence of fraud was ever found. Then we have João Teixeira de Faraia, very Portuguese sounding, born in 1942, Brazilian again, psychic surgeon, known by the nickname of John of, uh, the nickname of John of God but he has been accused of fraud on a number of occasions. Obviously, he denies them. Uh, you'll read about uh, John of God in the books. A great deal of controversy surrounds psychic surgery. If you listen to Guy's testimony who experienced it and witnessed uh, all kinds of incredible things, it's true. And those exponents of it, such as Arrigo and the other Arrigo, G. Arrigo, um, the testimony is, is, is wonderful. But there's psychic surgeons in the Philippines where I've seen videos where they were caught using sleight of hand and condoms filled with blood and the bits and pieces that they were removing turned out to be chicken gizzards and things like that. So very controversial but uh, you'll, you'll read both sides of the case, the argument, in Guy's books because he is a thorough investigator. But psychic surgery looks dangerous, mind you, because he talks about rusted razor blades or rusty scalpel and 
uh, they say the pa patients have even died from it. Well, um, there's all kinds of things around. And, and the problem with Brazil at the, in that era was it had a very, very poor health system. So people needed uh, spiritual healers and psychic surgeons. And some of these psychic surgeons, one of the ones who died in 71, I think, um, were totally selfless. The one man drove 12 hours across the Amazon um, from one part of Brazil to another, across the night, hundreds of miles, 600 miles maybe, I don't know. And he would do that every Friday after finishing his day job. Work then solidly, apart from catching time to sleep and eat, in, as a spiritual healer in um, one of the main cities. And then Sunday night he would do the return journey back. And I think he, he got killed on the car, in a car crash on one of those, his last journey. Uh, but that's an incredible story again, a selfless work rate of these mediums puts the rest of us to shame, it really does. Another subject covered by the books and by Guy is the subject of reincarnation, where, you know, that's the belief that the soul or spirit of a person can be reborn into a new body after death. The concept of reincarnation has been around for centuries, millennia, and it was a, a teaching of the early Christian church until uh, one of the councils did away with it. And of course, a lot of the world still believes in the idea of reincarnation today. The scientific evidence for reincarnation comes from people like Dr. Ian Stevenson, Dr. Ron Moody, or Professor Ron Moody, and um, uh, books such as the Leinegas family story, Soul Survivor. Uh, they mainly anecdotal reports, as aside from the fact that um, Dr. Stevenson's work is well and truly recorded. And he, in fact, he's the person who uh, noticed all the marks on the bodies of children as a fun fundamental part of the evidence. Uh, not just of the small children, mainly children, who remember their past lives. There's a famous English lady, isn't there? I've forgotten her name, but she was known as Om Seti, where she visited Egypt and knew she'd been there before and knew she was loved by one of the pharaohs, Seti. So she became Om Seti and lived out the rest of her life as a tour guide, very frugally uh, at the site taking tourists around the site because she, she walked around it and knew more about it in its di dilapidated state of ruin than the archaeologists. So that's covered in the books. In the book there's a detailed description of full form materializations which you know we all know that's one of the rarest psychic phenomena of all. And in the indefinite boundary, there is a, a details of a young Indian man who died of smallpox. And later the same evening, he's alive and well, but he's living as someone else. There's also a teenage ballet student who wins her teacher's praise when the teacher then learns the girl committed suicide three months earlier. And that's the story of the teacher witnessing uh, this, the former student dance in front of her, not realising that she was actually dead in the physical body. So here's a reading from The Indefinite Boundary, Chapter 9, The Facts of Death. There is no other side. There are only levels of apprehending a single incomprehensibly vast universe. That's a quote from Arthur Ford. A man dies, what then? 
One day in the summer of 1889, a Kansas country doctor lay in his bed at home, suffering the final stages of typhoid fever. Feeling that the end had come, he called his family and friends to his bedside and said goodbye to them. Then, anxious to save the undertakers too much trouble, he straightened his legs and clasped his stiffening fingers over his chest. His voice faltered, his vision blurred, and he sank into unconsciousness. The village church bell began to toll for him. For four hours he lay technically dead without noticeable pulse or heartbeat, but every time the family doctor was about to pronounce him dead, a barely perceptible gasp would emerge from his mouth, suggesting that there might still be hope. At this point the patient himself, Dr. Wiltz, spelled W-I-L-T-S-E, takes up the story. I lost, I believe, all power of thought, all knowledge of existence in absolute unconsciousness. I came up again into a state of conscious existence and discovered that I was still in the body, but the body I had no longer any interest in common. But the body and I had no longer any interests in common. I looked in astonishment and joy for the first time upon myself, the real me, the real ego, while the not me closed in upon all sides like a sepulchre of clay. With all the interest of a physician I beheld the wonder of my bodily anatomy, intimately interwoven with which he, even tissue for tissue was I, the living soul of that dead body. I learned that the epidermis was the outside boundary of the ultimate tissues, so to speak, of the soul. I realised my condition and reasoned calmly. Thus, I have died, as men term death, and yet I am as much a man as ever. I am about to get out of the body. Dr. Wilson then feels himself being rocked sideways, as in a cradle, as countless little cords seem to snap, separating his ego from the tissues of the body, starting with the feet. It is as if a stretched rubber band were contracting in the direction of the head, and finally he feels his whole self collected into his head. I am all in the head now, and I shall soon be free, he thinks. Inside his head, Wilson moves around his brain, before emerging between the sutures of the skull, like the flattened edges of a bag of membranes. Looking to himself something like a jellyfish, he then hovers around, before finally breaking loose and landing on the floor, fully out of the body. I seem to be translucent, of a bluish cast, and perfectly naked. The latter embarrasses him somewhat, since there are ladies present, but he soon realises that they cannot see him, even when he almost immediately finds himself fully clothed. He sees his old body lying on the bed and feels satisfied that he has died decently. With feet together and hands folded, he notices two people watching over his body. He knows they are women, but does not identify them as his sister and wife. He tries to attract their attention by bowing and waving at them, but to no avail. Then the situation struck me as humorous, and I laughed outright. Dr. Wiltser then leaves his house and goes out into the street. Only then does he notice a small cord, like a spider's web, that is still apparently linking him with his dead body. He feels elated, well aware that he has died and survived, and delighted to, to be so alive and be able to think clearly.
The rest of his long narrative takes on a dreamlike quality, reminiscent of the adventures of Air, Er, in Plato's Republic. And you remember that Plato's Republic is famous for his uh, allegory of the cave. Voices warn the doctor that if he goes on, he will be unable to return. He fully understands this, and after walking into a sort of black cloud, he loses his senses and wakes up back in his old physical body. He is both astonished and disappointed. What in the world has happened to me? He asked at once. Must I die again? Though still weak, Wilser immediately gave an account of his experience, writing a detailed report eight weeks later, which was reprinted in the SPR proceedings. Together with lengthy sworn testimony from four eyewitnesses and a note from his doctor declaring, I observed his symptoms closely. And if there are any symptoms marking a patient as inarticulo mortis that were not presented in his case, I am ignorant of them. I supposed at one time that he was actually dead, as fully as I ever supposed anyone dead. Two interesting features of the Wilson case are the bluish colour of the psi body and the spidery cord that linked it to his physical body. The blue colour is often mentioned in accounts of similar experiences, while the silver cord is a standard feature of what are known nowadays as out-of-body experiences. Reports of these date back to ancient Egypt, but no serious study of them seems to have been made until 1929, when Harry Wood Carrington and Sylvan Muldoon published a book based on the experiences of the latter, a remarkable invalid who seemed to be able to pop out of the body whenever he felt like it. And only yesterday I, I was uh, given testimony by a witness of someone who was capable of popping out of her body. Should have got that on tape, shouldn't I? One of my favourite readings from the book, from one of these books, uh, The Unknown Power. And it's basically a conversation between Sir Oliver Lodge, who was open-minded, but not a believer in anything spiritual, uh, as in spiritualism, until he decided to investigate the matter after the death of his son in the First World War. And then Sir Oliver investigated and he satisfied himself that our consciousness survives what we call physical death. And so he's talking with his friend Charles Richet, another eminent researcher. And, the, and Sir Oliver basically says to Charles Richet, well, how are you going to uh, <laughs> prove that you've survived? In one of his lighter moments, Lodge kidded his friend Charles Richet by reminding him that even if he were to wake up on the other plane after bodily death and find his spirit still alive, he would never be able to convince anybody of this great revelation. How would he go about trying to prove survival? Mention names of his friends through mediums, maybe. Nah, this is too natural. Refer to his own laboratory experiments. Well, we know all about them already. Predict that somebody will have an accident in a year's time. I'll be put down to coincidence. Read us some poetry in ancient French. Well, dramatising mediums are capable of anything, aren't they? 
you know, that's being done. Re reading uh, and creating poetry in ancient, often uh, unused languages. It's being done through mediumship, transmediumship. Speaking classical Latin through an illiterate medium. It's very interesting. But the incident should have been repeated. <laughs> it's always an excuse. Perhaps Riche will repent for his blind attitudes of the past and tell us of the joys of freedom from the flesh. That will be no use as hundreds of others have tried the same and nobody has believed them. Perhaps he will give a message about a lost notebook in a railway carriage. What triviality to concern himself with such rubbish under his new semi-divine conditions. And of course, uh, that uh, piece of evidence had occurred. And this is why it's mentioned. Poor Riche, there he is alive and well on the other side, and there is nothing he can do to prove it. If he gets a child to play music, that will just be another case of an infant prodigy. If he produces raps, ectoplasm and mysterious handshakes, that will just be the medium's good old subconscious at work. So how will he proceed with his demonstration? Lodge asks. I really do not know, nor will he. If he thinks he will be able to de demonstrate anything so preposterous as his own permanent discarnate existence, he will find himself deeply disappointed at the result. Any sort of explanation, or none at all, will be considered better than the fact of survival. It, it goes on, it goes on to talk about what Frederick Myers did. Uh, you could, you know, the two friends could be talking he's, and one might suggest, well, why don't you uh, enter into a 30 year cross correspondence of letters be using a whole number of different mediums to continue the correspondence, one letter upholding the other and so on and so forth, back and forth, all through different mediums. Would that prove survival of one party or the other? No, it's already been done and people don't believe it. Uh, it goes on and on and on this, uh, this conversation. How on earth literally does one demonstrate the reality of a Psy world? What is there left to try that has not been tried before? And sometimes I feel there must be a society for incarnate research on the next plane, whose members rack their psi brains for new ways to get through to us. They record snatches of Latvian on tape, Ben Fox on television, and they inspire Rosemary Brown to write pastiches of Liszt and other com composers. They perform miraculous operations in Brazil and the Philippines and they write book after book through mediums like Chico Shavia. Yet for the majority of non-spiritist Christians and agnostics the reality of an afterlife remains unproven. Well the debate between Lodge and Charles Richet highlighted the different ways that people think about the nature of the spirit and the possibility of communication with the dead. It is a debate that continues to this day, maybe. Um, 175 years of modern spiritualism and we're still doing our best to prove. Now I, I knew the story of uh, Oliver Lodge and Charles Richet, uh, light-hearted conversation there in, in the book, but I had no idea where to find it in this book. So I couldn't even remember the names of the two participants to the conversation. So I asked in my mind, oh, what was the name? Who, who was it? And uh, in a flash, straight away I heard uh, the name Charles Richet. So I, I looked in the index, Charles Richet, picked out the last entry and there was your reading. <laughs> and uh, they say the spirit world don't help us. Well, there we have it. I hope you enjoyed the videos and the readings from the book 
and my discussion on parts of the um, contents of the books. Highly recommend these two books, which, to my opinion, um, actually form one book, one large volume of evidence of the paranormal. Uh, thank you very much for listening. And remember, if you seek, you will find.